Well, welcome to Milford Sound. I'd like to invite you to take a trip with me in my de Havilland DH60 Moth Amphibian. We'll take a trip to Martins Bay. Switches off, sucking in. Switches on. Contact. If we see any orcas, we'll land in the bay, switch off and see if we can get some photographs of the orcas. Then we'll continue on over the mountains down into Martins Bay. The de Havilland DH-60 Moth, which is the 60 amphibian version, is a 1920s British two-seat touring and training aircraft that was developed into a series of aircraft by the Havilland Aircraft Company. Designed by Geoffrey de Havilland on the 22nd of February 1925, originally called the DH-60 Cirrus Moth, unit cost then in 1930 was £650. The DH-60 was developed from the larger DH-51 biplane, the first flight of the Cirrus-powered prototype DH-60 Moth was carried out by Geoffrey de Havilland at the Works Airfield at Stag Lane on the 22nd of February 1925. The Moth was a two-seat biplane of wooden construction. It had a plywood covered fuselage and fabric covered surfaces. A standard tailplane with a single tailplane and fin. A useful feature of the design is its folding wings which you've just seen and which allowed owners to hangar the aircraft in much smaller spaces. The then Secretary of State for Air, Sir Samuel Hall, became interested in the aircraft and the Air Ministry subsidised five flying clubs and equipped them with moths. The prototype was entered into the 1925 King's Cup race flown by Alan Cobham, deliveries commenced to flying schools in England. One of the early aircraft was fitted with an all-metal twin float landing gear to become the first moth seaplane, an example of which we're flying in today. The original production moths were later known as Cirrus 1 moths. Although the Cirrus engine was reliable, its manufacture was not. It depended on components salvaged from World War I era eight-cylinder Renault engines and therefore its numbers were limited by the stockpiles of surplus Renaults. Therefore de Havilland decided to replace the Cirrus with a new engine built in his own factory in 1928 when the new de Havilland Gypsy 1 engine was available. Everything was re-engined and the prototype of the DH-60G Gypsy Moth was produced. Next to the increase in power, the main advantage of this update was the Gypsy was a completely new engine. The new engines could simply be built in-house on a production line side by side with the production line for Moth Airframe. This enabled the Havilland Aircraft Company to control the complete process of building the Moth. Moth Airframe, engine and all, streamlined productivity and in the end, lower manufacturing costs. While the original DH-60 was offered for a relatively modest £650, by 1930 the price of a new Gypsy-powered moth was still £650. This in spite of state-of-the-art engines are defects of inflation. A metal fuselage version of the Gypsy moth was designated DH-60M moth and was originally developed for overseas customers, particularly Canada. The DH-60M was also licensed built in Australia, Canada and the United States. Also in 1931, a variant of the DH-60 was marketed for military training as the DH-60 Moth Trainer. In 1931, with the upgrade of the Gypsy engine as Gypsy 2, the Havilland inverted the engine and redesignated the Gypsy 3. The engine was fitted into all Moth aircraft and it was redesigned as the Moth Major. The subtype was intended for the military trainer market and some of the first aircraft were supplied to the Swedish Air Force. The DH-60T was re-engined and was redesignated Tiger Moth. The DH-60T Tiger Moth was modified with swept back main planes, the cabin struts 
were also the car bearing struts were also moved forward to improve egress from the front cockpit in case of emergency. Changes were considered great enough that the aircraft was redesignated to be having VH 82 side them off. Apart from the engine, the new gypsum off was still a standard VH 60, except for changes to accommodate the engine. The fuselage remained as before. The exhaust still ran alongside the left side of the cockpits and the logo on the right side still read D. Haviland Moth. The fuel tank was still housed in the bulging airfoil that formed the centre section of the upper wing. The wings could still be folded alongside the fuselage and still had the D. Haviland patented differential ailerons on the bottom main planes. Colour options still remained simple as before, wings and tail in moth silver, fuselage the colour of the buyer's choice. So now we've switched on and uh, we'll just sit here, float around and uh, wait for these orcas. Sometimes they turn up and sometimes they don't. No luck yet, so we'll take off and do a circuit and see if we can spot them from here. A little bit of artistic license there, the original moth did not have the electric start or the initial start. It was started the good old fashioned way by someone spinning the prop. It's not modelled in this aircraft but uh, we can say that we have an electric start fitting. So when looking for these orchids they are whales and uh, been through a blowhole so you should be able to see the water spout your eyes peeled for water spouts. They are in this area. There she blows. Two water spouts off the port wing. So now we need to circle and land quietly and switch the engine on. See what we can see. Now you can appreciate the advantage of an amphibian. You can just cut the engine. And have a look at these whales.
chips him off, responds well to control input. It's fairly easy to fly for a tail dragger. Its big parachute wings are very forgiving, and its stall speed is very slow, 25 knots with power. Its stall and spin characteristics are benign. It has some adverse yaw, and therefore requires rudder input during turns. Because the Tiger Moth has no electrical system, it must be started by hand, as I've mentioned previously. This needs to be done with care to prevent being struck by the propeller, which could result in very serious injury. Being a tail dragger, tacting also requires care. The pilot cannot see directly ahead, so the lower wing can hit obstructions. It's susceptible to gusts of wind. The takeoff is uneventful, and it has reasonable rate of climb. However, full power should not be maintained for more than a minute to avoid damaging the engine. The Tiger Moth biplane design makes it strong and fully aerobatic, but it only has ailerons on its bottom wing, which makes its rate of roll relatively slow for a biplane. Most manoeuvres are started about 90 to 110 knots, and it has a VNE of 140 knots. It's important to lock the automatic slats leading edge flaps during aerobatic manoeuvres. Not many people know the Tiger Moth had automatic slats. Of course, this was furthered in the Messerschmitt 109 in the Second World War. Wheel landings are straightforward as the plane is pushed onto the runway at moderate speed with just the front wheels on the ground. And then the tail's held up the speed reduces. The open cockpit allows pilots to stick their heads over the side to see the runway. As the aircraft is a tail dragger, it's essential to land it straight with no sideways movement and thus avoid the dreaded ground loop. So enjoy the scenery. The lake down below on the port side is Lake Never Never and just behind that we have Lake Pukatahai. Mount Pembroke is uh, just to the rear to the port side at 1,800 metres. mostly light from the south, just as we uh, about to commence our descent into Martin's Bay. Steady there, watch the narrow track on the carriage.
she's just killing me. She's got something real special 